We are live. Welcome to review of the 2015 through 2018 show, Daredevil. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a show I really loved all three seasons of. There will be some jokes and I will get into a few serious topics. So, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. This video is is a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in the franchise. So anything MCU that had come out before season one of Daredevil. And... Yes, yeah, so I have watched every episode once each. So, plot. 2015, Hell's Kitchen. The rampant crime is out of the cop's control. This calls for a vigilante, the daredevil. But is he making a difference? Doing the Luad's work? Or just indulging in his own desire to hurt people? And, yeah, so in order to follow this show, you don't really need to have watched... The MCU movies themselves, um, yeah, but if you do, you know, even if you decide to only watch this of the Netflix Marvel shows, if you don't watch Defenders after season two and before season three, there's going to be stuff you're confused by. You know, you, you can look it up if you want, but, you know, Defenders is only eight episodes so, let's see, that brings us to the writing. So, yeah, some of the people... Uh, right, this was created by Drew Goddard, who already, uh, you know... Yeah, before this, he had written The Cabin in the Woods, and... Yeah, okay, so he was also partially responsible for... Yeah, yeah, wrote and directed The Cat in the Woods. But he wrote it with Joss Whedon. And, yeah, he did also, he wrote... Hold on, I have it right... Here. He did write Cloverfield, but I think... we And, and some of Lost... But I think that can be forgiven considering this show. And yeah, this was... Of all of the... Of all of the, the Marvel Netflix shows... Let's see, I believe... Yeah, you know, this and Jessica Jones had three seasons. This is the only to have three different, you know, over the course of the three seasons, three different showrunners, or four, season two had two showrunners, but yeah. You know, and, and it's not the only one where, you know, Punisher was, had the same showrunner for both seasons. Iron Fist changed showrunners. Let's see, but, but yeah. Um, and, and because, you know, you can see some of that, that it changes over the course of it. But it is remarkably, you know, it, it doesn't feel complete. It, it, you can tell, but it doesn't feel removed from the, the earlier ones. So, this was the very first of the Netflix Marvel shows, which built up to the Defenders. Now, right after this one, they did start getting diverse, thankfully, but clearly, like with the MCU itself, they felt that in order to get people on board, they had to start with a gifted, attractive, young, white, straight, cis man, beloved by the ladies, because some people still can't empathize with minorities, and they like to imagine that they are Matt Murdock and Tony Stark, even though they're a lot closer to Todd. And, yeah. Of course, like with most things, there's a good way and a bad way to do that, and yeah, this did a really good job with that limitation. This and Jessica Jones were the only of these to get a full three seasons, even though all of them had some really good stuff going on. And... Yeah, so the... 
they get some stories out of the whole lawyer thing, you know, lawyer by day, vigilante by night. And the, the, um, there's a clear, like, Matt Murdock, lawyer by day, daredevil by night, is a, a you know, he, he, he does want the system to be able to take care of, of these things. It just doesn't always, or at least it seems like he wants that. The plot twists are great, and yeah, um, the pilot of this is excellent. It sets up the core cast of the show, Let's see, and their interpersonal relationships. It shows Matt the Daredevil beating up criminals and saving lives from organized crime, and the pro bono lawyer getting innocent people off. And yeah, you know, when I watched the pilot, I was like, I am really glad that I get to spend many hours with these characters. And the intro is very nicely done. I'm going to be quoting some from Wikipedia here. So, let's see. Elastic's creative director, Patrick Clare, came up with the idea of making a red world that was revealed by liquid, simulating the CG liquid, which was meant to be an ambiguous reference to poison and blood that behaved like something in between liquid chocolate and tar, was difficult, with Clare saying, it's hard to make an algorithm act insidious. And, yeah, developing the right consistency and behavior of the fluids was definitely a tricky process. And... Yeah, so the, um, yeah, you know, it's a very effective sequence, even though it does end on a shot of an angel face palming. Presumably she just drunk texted an X. And the finale is also excellent. I, since there's technically, yeah, I'll, I'll briefly, you know, all three seasons have excellent season finales. And technically, the season three finale is not, you know, it was not meant to be a series finale, but it works fine as that. It resolves the, the major stuff, you know, and I mean, you could tell that they did want to make a fourth season, and now we are getting something on Disney Plus with, you know, 18 episodes, I think, of Daredevil. At least one season um, probably won't be the same as what was supposed to be the fourth season, since you know, and and in general, yeah, they're probably going to MCUify Daredevil, which is too bad. But they did get some of the cast back, which is great. And yeah, um, essentially, the the um, yeah, whether you want to stop watching after season one, two, or The Defenders, you know, it does basically resolve things. You could be fine. Uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're not dealing with one of those shows where they were, f they were afraid that people wouldn't tune back in if they didn't leave it on a huge cliffhanger so that people would demand another season. But yeah, obviously, you know, the... It, it's, yeah, it's worth sticking with all three seasons. So... Let's see, the... Yes, direction. So, this is a show where pain hurts, where there are consequences. There are some non-linear episodes, but not so many that it's exhausting, like Alias. And, yeah, you know, for a lot of episodes, we will, you know... The pilot sets something up for the rest of the show. And then every episode after that is following an episode ending. And... Yeah, they tend to go right back to the thing we're most interested in based on the episode right before it. It was so frustrating when I watched Lost and it would refuse to go back to the thing we wanted to see after a major revelation. 
I could have forgiven it if it was a reason other than keeping us watching through stuff we didn't want to. And yeah, on this show, every episode matters, has something important to it. There's no filler, no time wasted. And yeah, it's a lot grittier than the movies, and I am here for it. Obviously, the movie are, movies are going to make more money if they're made for a PG-13 audience, but on Netflix, you can track a large audience with something that would be rated R if it was in theaters. Let's see. And, yeah, I, I like that the show raises the, the issue of whether Daredevil is making Hell's Kitchen better or worse, and... Basically, Kingpin is, in his own way, trying to save Hell's Kitchen. They, you know, they, they have different approaches, but they do agree that there's, you know, something needs to change for Hell's Kitchen. And, yeah, every so often the status quo will change in an interesting way. And it deals with not just an issue for singular people, but generational trauma. Many scenes that turn multiple times. You never know exactly where a scene or story will go. And if you have a show where the first season is very focused, it can be really effective if the second season, or at least one of the follow-up seasons, really goes and toys with what is set up in the first season. Maybe characters that have a lot of power lose that power, or vice versa. Maybe a major character loses something that used to define them and has to come up with a new identity. And, yeah. Basically, yeah, so... A short list of shows that do this, and not all of them in Season 2. Prison Break, Dexter, Alias, various Star Trek shows, Burn Notice, and yeah, um, I've only just started watching Punisher Season 2, but... So, so yeah, I, I can't really speak to that one yet, but all of the other, and, and you know, Defenders only had one season, but yeah, and this show manages to do it twice. Seasons 2 and 3 really change things, and the, yeah... And that brings us to the character. So, yes, Charlie Cox plays Matt Murdock slash Daredevil. I gotta say, I don't know anything else that he has made. I am I am aware that he is in... I'm gonna have to look up the... What is it called... Stardust. But yeah, I I don't know anything else that he has made, but yeah, uh, if he kept playing, if if they, like, if, if it becomes a really big deal with the, with the new, with, with Disney plus Daredevil, and he ends up playing the character, of, ah, I guess I, let's not exaggerate, uh, 10 years. I would just, I'd, I'd be completely down for that. He is just absolutely amazing. And, let's see. Right, so, Wikipedia describes him as a blind lawyer who leads a double life as the vigilante daredevil. And none of that is a spoiler. You find out very, very early on. It, it's in the pilot, all of that. And... Yeah, the season one's showrunner, Stephen DeKnight, explained Murdoch is not super strong, he's not invulnerable, he just has senses that are better than a normal human's. He's a lawyer by day, he's taken his oath, but every night he breaks that oath and goes out and does very violent things. The character's Catholicism plays a large role in the series, with DeKnight calling him one of the most, if not the most, religious characters in the Marvel Universe. Cox worked with blind consultant Joe Strick and was conscious of what his eyes were doing at all times to ensure they would not look at or react to something unlike a blind person. And Skylar Gertner plays a young Matt Murdock. And yeah, um, he does a really, really good job. Like, he has the, the charm where you can, like, believe, you know... As South Park has pointed out, some people are very uncomfortable around the physically disabled and you know basically this is a character who's horny in more ways than one he is flirting with every woman that he comes across and yeah you know he has this charm 
that helps pe put people at ease and, you know, not focus on him, you know, being blind. And the way that he will present arguments in court also deeply compel Like, you can really believe that he, you know, uh, what was it they... I believe he, yeah, he, he got the, the full um, summa cum laude, you know, and, and yeah, you can, you can completely see, you know, when, when you first hear him argue, you're like, he has a long career ahead of him. He can, this is, this is amazing. Now, as Daredevil, he has to be stealthy. He thought he'd wait till the time was right to ignite. People like him, they only come out at night. And since he's Catholic, he believes people deserve a second chance, so he doesn't kill. This is a principle of his, and it will be challenged. And Deborah Ann Wool plays Karen Page, an enigmatic young woman whose quest for justice sends her crashing into Murdoch's life. After portraying Jessica Hamby in True Blood from 2008 to 2014, Wool specifically tried to steer differently than that with Page. We'll noted that Paige's backstory would be different from the one in the comics, saying in the comic books, in the beginning, Karen is very innocent, and then towards the end, she's really swung a full 180. She's in a lot of trouble, so I wanted to find a way to make her both of those things at the same time. Can she be a really wonderful, kind person who is a little bit attracted to danger? She's not always getting into trouble because, oh, silly woman, Karen is actually looking for it, and she won't let her fear stop her from finding the truth. They made her very compelling, and, and yeah, it's true, like, I haven't read the, all of the old comics, but as far as I understand, in some of them she is basically the love interest, and she'll be put in danger, and, you know, so yeah, this show started in 2015, we were very ready for there not to be any more you know, just love interest, damsel in distress types in these kinds of stories being told in, you know, in this case, not a movie, but live action. And yeah, you know, she is intelligent, driven. There's no, like, she's actually, she's in danger very early on. And instead of like, you know, just running scared and something, she is actually doing what she can to maneuver into, um, you know, from, from right away you see that she's intelligent and she's not going to give up just because things look bad. You know, that's, yeah. Eldon Henson plays Franklin Foggy Nelson, Murdoch's best friend and law partner. In April 2015, Henson spoke of his excitement for the character role in the series, saying, I was really as excited as I was really excited as I was getting the scripts and reading that Foggy wasn't just a useless sidekick. He's not just comic relief. I mean, he is some of those things. He does have comic relief, but it was exciting to know that these other characters would have their own path and their own things they're, that they're dealing with. And one critic notes that he's more developed than in the comic. And again, haven't read that many of the comics, but yeah, I what little I read, he it seemed like he was just comic relief, like slightly bumbling. Um, yeah, not not particularly interesting, and just you know some some of these comic books. Keeping in mind, I love comic books. Some of them, especially some of the older ones, they kind of have some of the characters essentially so that there can be a conversation between two people. Or, you know, someone can take care of something for the main character with, you know, so that they can get that done without having to, you know, be present for all of the different, you know. And, yeah, what little I read seemed to basically be that. He was, he was just there so that there would be conversations instead of, you know, there's, there's still inner monologues and, and narration and such. But, yeah, you know, if you... If you want to understand a character, sometimes narration and that kind of thing works really well. But something else that can work really well is to have them near a character that they maybe largely agree with. So that there can be, not like a shouting match, but like a, you know, a discussion. So that the characters, you know, both what, um, how far are they willing to go for what they believe? Where does the other person say, ah, but that's as far as you're willing to go, you know, 
Sometimes other people get those things out of us. He is wicked smart, talking and legalizing his way out of just... Yeah, I don't, I don't want to give anything away, but just there were, there were multiple times where I thought, oh, wow, um, Foggy, I think you might be in over your head. And he will just, yeah, he will talk, yeah, he talks his way out of these situations that just, yeah. Toby Leonard Moore as James Wesley, Wilson Fisk's right-hand man. Moore described Wesley as both charming and dastardly as all hell. He is chilling like he is just you yeah just the 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 things that he has done for the kingpin the things that the ways that he solves problems just yeah you completely understand why the kingpin trusts him as much as he does because kingpin isn't exactly the most trusting Vondi Curtis Hall plays Ben Yurick, an investigative journalist for the New York Bulletin. And, yeah, he does an incredible job. Like, he really has... You believe that he has been a reporter for... I forget how many years they say, but like a decade or more. And he's just, like... He's really, really tired and really just exhausted with not being able to do the stories that he wants. And... You know, but he also does really, he has this strong drive. He wants to get the truth out there. And let's see. Bob Gunton as Leland Owlsley, a Wall Street financialist, accountant, and a key figure in, uh, yeah, that's not a spoiler, Wilson Fisk's plans. Ayelet Zurer, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I probably absolutely butcher that. Maybe, does it, uh, okay, it does not. Um, I have a lot of respect for her. She is Israeli, and, um, so I know that not every, oh, that, that's right, she does, yeah, yeah, um, Wow. Zack Snyder cast her in Man of Steel and gave her almost nothing to do. That's why I didn't even remember she was in that movie. Anyway, um, she's in Munich. I have to admit, I don't remember how big of a role she has done. A bunch of uh, Israeli, I guess, based on these titles. They, they look, yeah. I have to admit, the, the thing that I especially... Hold on. Am I... Do I have that? I'm, I'm almost 100% certain. I'm going to have to... I swear I'm not going to spend forever on this, but... I'm... Certain that she is the one that I saw in that other... That's right. She, she is also in Vantage Point, and there she's really great as well. Um, okay, so, I could have sworn that was, okay, I'm just, uh, Okay, I guess, I guess I remembered it wrong then. Um, I thought that was her in... Ah, uh, is that really? Okay, yeah, it says right here, it's not... Um, I thought that was her in the... Um, in Mother of Tears as the titular, but apparently not. Huh. I don't even know how I made that mistake. Anyway, but yeah, um, Ayla Zurer plays Vanessa 
and let's see. Yeah, I don't think I want to give too much away about her character, but she's very interesting and there's really... I did not expect to happen what happened with her character and she plays it incredibly convincing. Um, just the... Yeah. Rosario Dawson plays Claire Temple, a nurse who helps Murdoch. The character is an amalgam of the comic characters Claire Temple and Night Nurse. The character was originally going to be the actual Night Nurse, but was merged with Temple when the writers learned Marvel Studios had plans for that character in the films. Dawson explained Temple is a normal person and she becomes... Uh, yeah, she changes in a way she didn't expect. She's not a love interest. She's the skeptical eye looking at this strange situation. She's the one who can be like, you're not really good at this. And that makes it feel more real. Yeah. Um, the... I don't want to give away exactly how she and Murdoch meet. But they do. And they talk about whether or not they think what he's doing is having an impact and the fact that she is a nurse means you know she's in the hospital working not committed and but she is committed to working and when he beats someone up or when someone else gets you know badly hurt she's the one who deals with them so she can give a real, like, she's seeing it day by day. She's seeing what he's doing, the people he's beating, and the people being beaten by people he hasn't beaten yet. And that's a, yeah, that's a really good way to get this kind of other perspective on, is it making a difference, you know, or does he just want to, to beat people? And, yeah, Vincent D'Onofrio plays Wilson Fisk, the kingpin. And, I mean, I've been a fan of his since as far back as I can remember. You know, when I was a kid, it was probably the first Men in Black movie. Sugar. As I got, you know, yeah, as a teenager, it was almost... Definitely, um, I'm gonna make sure I get the right title here. The, um, the Kubrick movie, Full Metal Jacket. He is incredibly talented, and I'm really glad. I, I remember when he, uh, he technically does appear in the first Sinister. And I remember when that happened, you know, there were some jokes about, wow, is this what his career has come? Because it's not a big role. And it's not like he didn't really need to show up for the role. It's not very, you know, it's not substantial. Not, you know, neither in the amount of screen time he's given, nor in, like, how deep the character is or how much, you know, like, it, his character could almost be replaced with a Wikipedia page, and that's not great. So I was a little worried that, oh, I mean, maybe, you know, everybody not, you know, eventually your, your career ends, you know. But, yeah, he, he really, it, this was an incredible role for him. He did, he did such an amazing job. Um... I do still like the late great. Uh, I'm gonna get it really quickly. The the late great Michael Clark Duncan in the 2003 Ben Affleck movie Daredevil, but this is definitely the the better one. A powerful businessman, crime lord, whose interest in the future of Hell's Kitchen brings him into conflict with conflict with Murdoch and Daredevil. D'Onofrio stated he hoped his portrayal of Fisk was a new way to look at the character and that it would be the definitive portrayal of Fisk. Yeah, um, I think it's going to be a long time before 
there's going to be a different Fisk that is like really stands out and is amazing. Stephen tonight detailed that Fisk has very many aspects, so it's not all I want to conquer the city and make a lot of money. And see. If you're looking for a juicy, multifaceted crime drama, Wilson Fisk was the obvious choice to play the antagonist. He really felt like the right yin to the yang for Matt and for what we wanted to do. And Cole Jensen plays a young Wilson Fisk. And yeah, um, yeah, it's not it's not a spoiler to say you know there is a theory that he is maybe on the spectrum, and that makes a ton of sense both for like the the depiction and just. Yeah, the the I don't think that was the the character in the, the as far as I know that was something they you know came up with for the show and yeah it's a really great change because because yeah it, I mean holy crap by 2015 we had seen a lot of crime lords especially in TV you know so so yeah. Um, they had to do something that was really, really different, you know, and that would really stand out. And just, yeah, like, if you if you haven't seen D'Onofrio in anything else, if you, if this, if his performance is this, is the only thing you've seen, you might legitimately believe that he is on the spectrum. So, which I'm almost 100% certain he isn't even though he does yeah i guess most of the stuff i have seen him in he does have that kind of um yeah what's the word he has some vibe of that but uh, i'm just gonna really quick yeah it doesn't look like at least if if it if that is something that's known about him it does not show up on his wikipedia Oh, he was on the the series in addition to the original Men in Black. Cool. Um, but yeah. And I suppose it's not a spoiler to say that at some point during the show, John Bernthal will show up as Frank Castle, the Punisher. I'm not going to talk that much about him here since I am also doing a review of the Punisher show, show itself. But I do really appreciate that the... Let's see. Um, yeah, the, you know, the, the um, Travis Bickle from Taxi Driver was an influence. And... <clears throat> and, yeah, he is one of the characters who challenge Matt's idea that, you know, killing criminals is crossing a line. Because, yeah, you know, basically he says, you're a half measure. You hit them and they come back up. I hit them, they stay down. And, yeah, you know, the, the, it's, it's um, the moment that you have a character who says that they're willing to go really far, but not quite cross that line, you kind of have to... It, it makes a ton of sense to bring in someone else to, to poke at that and say, but what if you did, though? And that is also where Elodie Young's Electra Nachos comes in. A mysterious and dangerous woman from Murdoch's past. And... Let's see... Describing Electra's effect on Murdoch, Petrie called her the best bad girlfriend you can possibly have. She does everything wrong and attractive. She's Matt's id, the wild side. Matt is always taming his wild side. Electra just lets it out. He's both repulsed and deeply drawn to that. And... Let's see... Yeah, and Electra is neither good nor bad, a person with different traits and layers. And Lily, she plays a young Electra. And yeah, um, 
some of the biggest fans of Elektra do still think that, you know, they, they are not happy with the Elodie Young version. But the I, I definitely, and, and I'm not going to tell them that they're wrong for that. I really appreciate that they did something different here than in, you know, if you, you might, you know, not everybody remembers, in addition to the Daredevil movie where Elektra also shows up, Elektra got her own movie. It just wasn't particularly well received. I don't, per I don't personally think it's very good. Um, yeah, uh, the, the, um, I think guess I there's um there's a video by princess weeks I think I will just link in the in the description box for this video where she details the the whole thing and yeah she she does a really great job there we go um but but yeah um they do something different here than they did in those two movies so, you know, and, and in some ways, it's closer to what... Oh, oh, right. Do note, if you watch the video, I suppose maybe I'll put... Contain spoilers for... Let's see... There we go. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah. You know, I am I myself am not an expert on her character. I, I like the character. I think she's cool. Um, you know, I mean, I remember this one time where Spider-Man is just exhausted with how he, you know, he, he feels like no matter how many crimes he stops, there's still so much crime out there. So he's about to launch, he, he's picked up, like, a train car and is about to toss it directly onto, you know, a criminal, to be sure, but a human being. Like, it, it, would, it would smush him. There's no way that he would survive if Spider-Man threw this. And, you know, it's not like Electra, she doesn't have super strength. She's not going to be able to, like, stop the, the train. So she does the only thing she can do, she talks to him. And she actually talks him, she, you know, Electra Nachos talks Spider-Man, Peter Parker, you know, the, the, yet another hero who does not want to kill. Yeah, she manages to talk him out of killing. And, you know, I, I think they do also point out, wait, this, this feels backwards, but, you know, she, she has killed, she does kill she doesn't want him to have to deal with what that's like, you know. So, yeah, she holds a special place in my heart. Spider-Man being my favorite comic book character. But, yeah, um, I know. Uh, what, what, is, what is it the kids say these days? Uh, basic, I think. Um, but, yeah, I, I really appreciate that they they go where they do go with her in the Marvel Netflix shows, and, yeah, I, I really appreciate the, the, like, she gives, she gives a really great performance, like, you could understand, like, if she was just, like, pure evil, and, and just, like, this, this monster, it would be like, well, what is, what on earth does Matt see in her, but no, she does have, like, there is this, she's, a challenge, you know, it's like how some, some, you know, some, some people find Spock to be sexier than Kirk, because anybody can get with Kirk. Spock, that's a challenge, you know, that's something, you know, so if you actually do, you know, it just, it, it, it triggers something in, uh, yeah, it, it does something to us when someone were attracted to, you know, yeah, we, we find it extremely attractive sometimes when someone is difficult to, you know, yeah, we, we want to see if we can be, you know, can, can I be the one to, to actually break through and, and be the person that they find, you know, that they actually 
really like. So, yeah. And let's see. Um, I, yeah, Joanne Whaley also appears, and yeah, she does a really great job, um, I gotta say, it was, it's very interesting watching this as the new Willow show is also, you know, on Disney+, Plus and seeing her, you know, not, not very many years between her appearing on this and then the the Willow show from from this year but the the yeah that was that was interesting but she she does a really great job and Jay Ali plays Rahul Ray Nadim and yeah uh, an honest and ambitious FBI agent and his character was also really compelling i did not see coming where they went with him and that was very very just very compelling and Wilson Bethel plays Benjamin Poindexter and he is also FBI and some people have said that they could pretty quickly figure out what was going to happen with his character I can see what they mean. I think it was quite good. Some some people feel that he gets too much, uh, too much screen time and development. I can, I can see what they mean. I do think that there's sufficient payoff for it. And just yeah, um, he he gives a really strong performance. You really believe that he is who he says he is when in reality he's he's an actor you know it's uh, just yeah and yeah like prison break there are some really great bad guy henchman characters that die really early but also make a really strong impression some criminals are given complex personalities situations and backstories especially the main villain ones and this shows how ethnically diverse hell's kitchen is in real life all actors are convincing as what they're playing. Lawyers, nurses, doctors. This is a show full of actors and writers who understand the characters they're performing and writing, respectively. And I really love seeing Matt and Foggy fight for innocent people who've been wronged. The show also features Scott Glenn, the That Guy actor of all That Guy actors. Now, Elton Henson was actually in various Disney movies before Daredevil, so... He tried to flee to Netflix, but now all episodes of this are on Disney+. Plus. There's no escaping the mouse! Huh? And, yeah, I'm not going to spoil, spoil who, but the characters that stay around for the longest in the show tend to get the most development, become tremendously interesting, go through a lot of growth. Now, this might sound obvious, but honestly, there are shows that ran much longer than this did that did not accomplish that. And now that brings us to the dialogue. Now, <clears throat> the show does, of course, have a lot of information that could only be given via exposition and verbal at that. However, something they do a lot is have the characters who know a thing that the audience needs to know interacting with a character who doesn't know, which is a lot more interesting and especially works that uh, it especially works well. These are compelling characters that we want to spend more time with and that they often work work in characterization and growth. Like instead of just like, you know, two characters telling each other what both of them already know because now the audience can hear it. In this show, a character that knows something will talk to another character, and, you know, for example, maybe the them telling the other character is actually, you know, maybe they're sharing a secret that is supposed to, you know, and it's like, what do you want in return for that? You know, and and 
various things like this. So it doesn't it doesn't feel like we're just being talked to, which it, it can be very frustrating if you're sitting and watching a show for a long time and it's just a lot of talking to the audience. The show has a lot of talking. The Disney Plus MCU shows have more action and or bigger action, but the characters doing the talking are interesting. The dialogue is good, the lines are well delivered. Every episode has at least one action scene, some of them have more, and some are non-stop tension, even without a lot of action. But some only have the one, so... Let's see... Um... Right, and yeah, I, th I think the reason is that the show was made in part to binge, and it can get exhausting watching a lot of action scenes. It's easier to binge dialogue shows. It's also easier on the budget. It's perhaps less an action show and more of a Law & Order CSI NCIS with some action scenes. Well, more action scenes that are on those shows. Now... And that brings us to the cinematography. Now, there are s some really long takes in this. Each season has at least one long take fight scene. And they're just spellbinding. They're amazing to look at. Um, and the, you know... Uh, when, when you do, like, a long-take fight, apparently, I, I heard recently, yeah, one of, the, one of the videos that came out when I did research for this, apparently, like, one of the, you know, from, from a while back, not, not this show, but, you know, was it maybe a John Woo movie or something, they, they thought that it would be an easier, a, a quicker way to do the action than instead of all the different setups for traditional action scenes. But... This show really uses them. Like, there's at least one long take where you can actually see one of the people there getting progressively more, like, worn down and tired. Obviously, you could do this if it, you know, if it was edited as well. But then it would probably be these more subjective... You're essentially getting an objective view of the fight, you know. And... Yeah, I think it would have been distracting if they cut to like shots that just really underline, oh, he's you know, he's really tired. So instead, we just see it in the the physical performance, and yeah, it was it really just gripping to watch. And yeah, there's some Brian De Palma style. You know, there's this there's this one shot where the camera will pan around something. And, like, at first, you don't see Daredevil in the shot anywhere, and then when it pans back, like, yeah, I think at least one of them, it does a 360, and when it's back to the original position, Daredevil is there, and it's, like, just, it's, it's, I realize that Batman Begins did it before this show did, but it is still really compelling to see this kind of thing, you know, we're, we're used to seeing the hero jumping in, before they, you know, but here you might just see them, like, land and be ready and just, yeah. And there's a there's one time where the camera will pan and Daredevil disappear while the camera is off him without it cutting. You know, we see as it pans back to where he was before, you know, there's no one there anymore. And he wasn't there, you know, he wasn't caught by the camera as it was panning. Just, yeah. And there's this one fight where we see shadows and silhouette per, silhouettes perform martial arts, but not a clear shot. Just, this is a gorgeously shot show. And the editing is also really excellent. Given that this is a show, you know, some of the, some of the things that have happened to these characters that have really defined their lives happened, you know, 20 years ago. So... You know, you, you can't just... It, it has to go back in time sometimes. And it does it really well. You know, the moment that you're... If, if you're telling a really interesting story in the present day and you cut 
to before the present day. Like, at the end of the day, like, well, okay, I already, I know that's the guy who's in the presence, so, I mean, I know he doesn't, like, die or anything. Um, I was kind of enjoying watching the story as it was going in the present, but okay, I guess we'll, we'll go back a little. That can, you can really shoot yourself in the foot with that. You know, once again, lost. But on this show, I, I don't think there was a single time where when they went from one thing to, like, a completely different, like, time. Yeah, every single time, I was deeply compelled. I was really enjoying, because, you know, the good thing about jumping back in time in a, in a story is that you can learn something and you can actually see it happen instead of just being told, by the way, 20 years ago... I did this and this, you know, it's when you actually see it and you have actors performing, you know, yeah, I already mentioned that uh, several of the main cast have actors that play younger versions of them. So, yeah, it will go back in time and, yeah, every single time I was happy with it. It's, it's fairly rare that there isn't a single misstep in that. And, I, yeah, I, I do... For sure, some of they they didn't have a specific like um, running time for the individual episodes. This is not like you know, yeah. I, I did a you know I've done in depth version videos talking about Prison Break. That show was on TV. They had to you know th there's only so many seconds of leeway. An episode basically has to be 42 minutes so that they can fit in all the, the advertisements. Um, this show, they didn't... Uh, yeah, you know, some episodes are like 40-ish minutes, some are over 50. But the all three seasons were apparently... You know, there was a demand by... Must be Netflix, I don't think any of the anyone watching was completely dead set on it but yeah there had to be 13 episodes to each season and essentially all of the marvel netflix shows struggle with it. again keeping in mind i have not yet watched the last season of the punisher or jessica jones but the 13 se 13 episode seasons otherwise do struggle um, and it's, yeah, I, I wish that they had just said, okay, eight episodes, ten episodes, because The Defenders only runs eight episodes, and the second season of Iron Fist only runs ten episodes, and they're both better paced than most of the, the 13 episode seasons, so, yeah, you have some episodes where not much will necessarily change, but I, I do maintain there is no filler episode, you know, three times 13, so that's 36, 39 episodes. There's no filler. All of them accomplish something. Like, uh, I wouldn't tell anyone... I, I wouldn't suggest anyone stop watching before you've watched all of them. Un unless you just do not have time, which is, of course, the issue with, you know, ongoing series and such. But, but yeah, um, this is... Again, I without being able to compare to Jessica Jones Season 3 or The Punisher Season 2, but otherwise, these are probably the best-paced 13-episode seasons. You know, I, I maintain that overall, the pacing is better in the, the two seasons that don't have 13 episodes, but, you know, if you if you got to have 13 episodes, and apparently they did, yeah, this one really does an incredible job with those, and... Yeah. The special effects, um, there's not a huge amount of CG, you know, on account of, again, budget. But, you know, there are scenes of people shooting at each other, for example. Um, bullets hit solid objects. People get hit and bleed. There are a lot of war wounds on this show. And... Yeah, they always look convincing. You know, this is something that... Uh, 
if, if you're trying to convince the audience that someone is hurt and we look at the effects and it's like, I mean, I can, I can tell what you did there. That can really pull you out of, you know, essentially, if you're looking at someone who's wounded, you know, you're either supposed to go like, ooh, that looks like it hurts or yeah, they deserve that. And, you know, so, some, this show has some of both of those. And in both cases, if you just don't believe what you're seeing, that can really be an issue. Um, I realize I'm literally the only person on the planet who still ever thinks about the Blade TV show. But that had... It, it, yeah, it would happen on occasion, and there was one time in particular where the, yeah, the, the show ran in 2006 on, um, what was it called again? The uh, Spike TV. And I realize, I get it, they were on a TV budget, you know. The, the, um... Yeah, and, and, like, it was smaller because it was a smaller channel, maybe, network, or so, I forget, but yeah. There was one part where a character is supposed to be, like, really, really messed up. And, like, basically, like, um, a lot of the character's body is badly injured. And I get why... What they did was cover the actor in, you know, the, the um, I mean, probably latex or something, and then put wounds on top of the latex. But when you watch the scene, it's just like, I, I'm sorry, but I can tell that's not what you would look like if your entire body had wounds, it wouldn't just, you know, and it, I mean, essentially, that's the kind of thing that they would normally do if there's, like, one wound, or, or a few wounds, you know, they, they cover that part of the, the, the actor's body and, and put wounds on top, and here, it just, it, it, there, it just wasn't convincing, and it really took me out of it, and that never happens on this show, despite the limited budget. You know, they tend to make sure that the money... The, the budget is right there on the screen. Like, you can see really impressive stuff instead of them paying for something that doesn't actually look or sound that impressive. You know, there, there are expensive things that just aren't that, you know, that don't necessarily show up on, on screen. There's some incredible stunt work. The, the, um, the fighting in this show is just amazing. And... You know, ultimately, Charlie Cox did have a stunt double for the show, but you can also tell some of it he's clearly doing himself, you know, and it's just, yeah, um, brutal, bone-breaking action that really feels, ri like, st uh, characters will get much more injured than you see in the movies. You know, in, in the movies, you're either... Like, it's basically alive or dead. There there aren't that many cases where someone is really badly injured and, like, actually, you know, moves slower or maybe can't move at all. That kind of thing. And that happens on this show. And, yeah, if, um, if you are not comfortable with graphic violence, you know, I, I heard about, you know, someone who actually... Stop watching during one part of the show, and I get why. This was filmed in New York, so it has that very authentic feeling and incredible lighting. You can easily tell the difference between the harsh lighting of Josie's Bar, the bright and soothing light of the art gallery, the dark and dingy warehouses, alleys, etc. Just amazing work you know because again at the end of the day like you know it used to be you know it's you know people are gonna pay a lot of money to see a picture or they gotta be able to see everything and they would just light so that everything shows up and it's like i mean 
it's it's nice i guess but there's no atmosphere here there's no there's no atmosphere to the lighting at least and that's they really do incredibly well on on the show here like you you know they they go to Josie's bar it's this really it's it's clearly not a very expensive place it's, you know so they're yeah you know they only have so many lights at the bar you know in 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 universe and they're not going to turn them up hugely because they don't make enough money to that you know so it's actually you know they get across that it's almost unpleasant to be at this bar like you can barely see some of the time without it being unpleasant for us the viewer at home to look at now and right and also of the the acting sometimes things go well for daredevil sometimes they go poorly so it's not predictable during action scenes and scenes of tension and the like, the cameras handheld, tending towards medium close-up shots, which is quite effective and really puts you right there. But the cinematography also gets visually stunning at times, with you know aforementioned Brian De Palma long takes, and you know the camera will gradually pan across something important. And let's see. Yeah, um, one one fight is a badass, bloody, bone-breaking, street-level fight scene in the pouring rain. No MCU movie that had been released when the first season, you know, premiered on Netflix had an MCU hero as messed up as we see some of the, the major characters in this. Let's see... You know, the, yeah, the one that came the closest, Steve Rogers, at the end of Captain America 2, that was because he allowed Bucky to keep hitting him. But, you know, here, for example, Matt is a street-level hero who gets beaten up because he's fighting regular people up close with his hands. Not always bare hands, but, you know, yeah, still. like, And, and that's, you know, if, if you just watch a lot of movies and, and TV shows, you might not know this, and I don't know from personal experience... Thankfully, but yeah, you know, if you are in a lot of fights, you might get hurt yourself, you know. Um, if you hit someone with the with a clenched fist really hard in the face, it can actually hurt your, you know, your wrist and your knuckles. So it actually is, you know, and, and yeah, you know, he's frequently outnumbered he's not always um yeah you know a lot of the people he fights are street level criminals but like street level criminal 101 like if somebody shows up and is trying to stop you you might have to fight them in order to um what's the word yeah yeah you know it's a um you know, if, if you can't even fight off some random, you know, maybe there's a Good Samaritan who, you know, comes upon the crime in progress. Maybe there's another criminal who wants, you know, who wants to take it over, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and let's see. Motivated action scenes, not just to wake up the audience as it is in some action fiction and action scenes vary based on who's taking part in them. They don't try to force distinct characters with different fighting styles to fight in the same way as each other. And yeah, the, the, some of the season two action is bigger and more frequent. Probably bigger budget due to success. And yeah, one critic pointed out, people fight dirty and get hurt. They fight like UFC. And that brings us to the music, which was composed by John Paisano. And yeah, not really. I don't think I've watched anything else of his. He did the Maze Runner trilogy. Um, last year's Diary of a Wimpy Kid. This year's Night at the Museum, Kamun Ra Rises Again. But he does a really great job, uh, you know, really suspenseful, intense music, and just, yeah, really, really well done. And 
the sound design is great. Like, you will hear every single bone breaking in in fights and such. Like, it is not... There's... There's... It's... It's not a pleasant experience, but it's it's it feels real. And yeah, so the the pacing, some episodes move faster and more will happen than and, and more dramatic things will happen compared to others. It definitely like I do think overall um you know, not now that they've already done it, but if they were to, you know, if you could travel back in time and tell them, you know, ten episodes, you know, try, can can you can you make the story work in ten episodes? You know, overall, there are times where that, where you can tell, you know, okay, that would have maybe been, but by and large, the, the pacing is really excellent. And, yeah, um, if you aren't sold on watching the show, the, the pilot, uh, I forget exactly, but it's, like, less than an hour. If by the end of the pilot you don't want to watch more, I'm not sure there's much of anything on the show that's going to come after that that, yeah. Um, well, well, some of the characters who show up later, but, yeah. So, the best element of the show is definitely the grit. And, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, and, and it's definitely, it's worth watching just, like, if you just like gritty action, you know, even if the, the, even if there's nothing else about this that appeals to you, just gritty action, yeah, I would recommend this. Uh, the worst aspect is probably, um, yeah, I don't... I think this was actually only... Yeah, some of season one has an issue with uh, sexualizing female characters against their will and or for no good reason. But it's really... It doesn't... There's not so much of it that it completely de derails. You know, it, it's it's uncomfortable watching, but... Yeah, and I'm not... I'm definitely not... You know, if you... If you think that it will be too much for you, and and you decide not to watch it because of that, I completely support that decision. Um, yeah. So the worst thing, according to others, some said that some of the villains are bad. Uh, I don't. I don't really agree. But, um, yeah. I I personally, I really love the the villains here. The thing I was most worried about was filler, and the show exceeded my expectations. The thing I was most looking forward to was street-level vigilantism depiction, and the movie, the show exceeded my expectations. And, yeah, um, you know, all three season openers, season finales, and overall seasons, they're all excellent. Um, let's see... Ultimately, the trailers do give at least a little too much away, but they also give you a good idea of what the show is like. The cover and poster do not give too much away, but also have the vibe of the um, show very nicely. And oh, there we go. So on... Rotten Tomatoes. Okay. Uh, view all, I guess. Um, there we go. Yes, so this has a 92% overall. And the, yeah, season one had a 99%. Season two, 81. And season three, 97 and the individual audience scores, 93 for season 1, 89 for season 2, and 85 for season, season 3. Okay, yeah, yeah, right, so not, not everybody loved season 3 as much as, I, I think it's really excellent, I, I yeah, 
Um, if you, if you, for some of season two, you're like, ah, oh, this is kind of, eh, you know, t try to see if you can at least get to, to the end of season two. And then you may very well want to go for the Defenders. And if by the end of watching Defenders, you don't want to watch Daredevil season three, I guess me saying that it's excellent isn't going to change your mind. But yeah, um, all three seasons are certified fresh. And on Metacritic, it has a 72 out of 100 and 7.2 out of 10 users. For, for users. Um, yeah, on IMDb, it has actually... It might have changed since last time, so I'm just going to get the updated number. On, yes, 1,233 user reviews on IMDb, and without spoilers, 1,012. And I read the, the top voted 100 without spoilers. There are 192 links in the IMDb external review section and only 63 that were in English and not dead links. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, it has an 8 point... On, uh, there we go. 8.6 out of 10 on IMDb based on 4, 442,129 user votes 33.5 gave it 10 30.79 20 20.58 8.57 3.16 okay 5 and 1 are 1 1.3 and 1 1.2 respectively 4 is 0 0.6 3 is 0 0.4 and 2 is 0 0.3 percent so Statistically speaking, this is a beloved show, and it's not hard to see why. And let's see, so this was, um, yeah, this was nominated for Primetime Emmy Outstanding Stunt Coordination for Drama Series, Limited Series, or Movie, but apparently didn't win. I have no idea what could do, what could outdo this, but uh, let's see. yeah, it had 43 nominations, only nine wins. Uh, let's see, yeah, and the sound editing was also nominated for an Emmy. Um, yeah, some of the acting was nominated. Um. It was it it won the Saturn Award for Best Streaming Superhero Television Series, and Charlie Cox and Deborah Wall were both nominated for their performances, and it won Saturn for Best New Media Television Series, and let's see. IGN, it won the best TV comic book adaptation. And IGN's People's Choice Award, best TV action series, best comic book adaptation for IGN also. And Let's... yeah. Now, there are times in, in the show where the, let's see, yeah, so I, um, yes, to give brief, I, I mentioned it earlier, but to give more detail, 
women on the show will sometimes become sexualized for the male gaze, not that of Matt, but of the viewer. Now, there isn't anything inherently wrong with the character being sexualized, but a lot of straight men perceive a sexualized woman as lesser than one that isn't sexualized. And, yeah, some of it is not in service of characterization. And, you know, Dexter, for example, would also sexualize women against their will. At least some of the times that... Uh, let's see, is actually in service of characterization, and yeah, you know, some of the later stuff, like there's romance stuff and such, and yeah, the, the sex will be done in a way where it shows the, the relationship between the two characters having sex, uh, you know, who is the more dominant one, and who initiates uh, does the other person try to stop it or immediately give in to, to the temptation? You know, these these kinds of things. Um, yeah, and the, the yeah, all of the um, Marvel Netflix shows does that well. It's just that on this show it started out not doing that all that well. So, yeah, I don't know, maybe um, after, like I mentioned... I don't remember it being a problem outside of season one at all. So, you know, maybe they got some feedback. And, yeah, so the episodes are no longer on Netflix, as far as I know. Don't have Netflix, don't plan to. They are all on Disney+. Plus. All of Marvel Netflix is currently on Disney+. Plus. And there aren't special features for these shows, but, you know, they are... Um, I wasn't sure right away that I was going to get into more than just the, the you know, they said they were going to do more Daredevil, so I decided, since I'm, you know, I'm paying for Disney+, Plus whether I'm watching Marvel's Netflix or not, so I might as well watch it, um, you know, and, and I have spare time, obviously, if you don't have that, you're, yeah, but... Um, yeah, at, at first I was thinking, I guess, maybe just Daredevil, and then I read, you know, your, um, let's see, yeah, the, you know, since Daredevil shows up in The Defenders, you know, I decided to watch that as well, and I read that, you know, most of the seasons were well-received, and so I decided to watch all of these, and, and really, like, if you start liking one of these, it makes a lot of sense to at least try some of the other ones. L like I mentioned, I've watched almost all of it by now. I watched it, I'm, I'm watching all of it in the order that it premiered. So by now, let's see. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yeah, I guess 11 seasons worth. So, you know, and most of those seasons are 13 episode ones. And, yeah, I mean, I knew Daredevil from the comics and the 2003 movie. I am, I, I was already aware that there was something called the Iron Fist. Um, I don't think I'd read anything that Jessica Jones appeared in. Um, and I knew of Luke Cage since, you know, he's a phenomenon. Um... But, but yeah, you know, and I ended up, like, there's only one season of any of these that I didn't love. So, yeah. Um, and, and usually, like, if you just watch the first episode of a season of, of one of these, yeah, the, a lot of them start slow, but you will get some of the ingredients that will, you know, become bigger over the course of it. But, yeah. I rate this eight well-choreographed, gritty, street-level, physical fight action scenes out of ten. And, yeah, so ranking all of the seasons that I've watched so far, worst to best, the only one I don't love is Iron Fist Season 1. So, Iron Fist Season 1, Daredevil Season 2, The Defenders, Punisher Season 1, Iron Fist Season 2, Daredevil Season 3, Luke Cage Season 2, Luke Cage Season 1, Daredevil Season 1, Jessica Jones Season 2, and Jessica Jones Season 1. Now, 
hit me up in the comments. Let me know what do you think was the best Daredevil season? What was the character that you hope the most they bring back in the Disney Plus show? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoilerful thoughts on the most recent episode of Willow. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, but with the thoughts in the same video instead of in a separate video, since its running time is significantly shorter than a show, that was something I meant to say earlier. I just realized now, um, I did videos on all three of the seasons where I talk spoilers and... Yeah, so if you're interested in that, the link to the playlist for that is in the description box uh, called MCU Thoughts. And the playlist is getting long, so, you know, you might have to scroll a bit to, to get, or word search. Um, yeah, in other words, if you want videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching recording. And yes, if all goes well, one more video this week. So yeah, fingers crossed. And if not, I will catch you next time. Or I, yeah, regardless, I'll catch you at some point in the future.